Okay, Claire Bidwell-Smith, we're here at the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books. Your book is After This. When life is over, where do we go? Welcome. Thank you. Uh, the Rules of Inheritance is your previous book, and a lot of people got to know you in that book and got to know the story uh, of you losing your parents at a relatively young age as an adult mm -hmm. and the process of dealing with that. And this seems like the logical next step to wonder, like, what happens after death? Yeah, well, I mean, I lost my parents so young. They both got cancer when I was 14. Uh, my mother was gone by the time I was 18 and my father at 25, so I just spent so much time thinking about death and what happens when we die. For a long time, I was in a lot of pain in my grief, so I felt closed off to there being something on the other side. It was, um, it was made me feel too vulnerable to open up to all the different ideas. There's so many ideas about what happens when we die, and to like open up to that was overwhelming, so I didn't, I shut it out, and I was just, this is it, it's over. Gradually, as I moved through my grief process and into adulthood, I became a grief counselor, I worked in hospice, I became more curious and more open to exploring what happens next for myself, for the people I was counseling, um, for the people I'd lost too, you know, like I wanted to regain some connection with them. So it was a natural next step, I think, just in terms of, you know, psychologically maturing as we come to understand ourselves, the world, death, life. Where did you start off when you first started thinking about it? Because there's a lot of different things you can think about what happens after death. Um, spirituality plays, your views on spirituality play into it, your views on the afterlife play into it. Where did you start off when you began the process of thinking, you know, and working through that process of what, what happened to your mom and dad? I started off with psychic mediums. <laughs> And it was really born out of a, a vow I made to a dying best friend when I was 21. When my very best friends died of leukemia at 21, and as she was dying, we talked a lot about death. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Everybody wanted us to be really positive, the doctors, her family, she was so young. And we felt, we would like have these secret conversations about death because we Did felt like we were gonna get in trouble. She wanted about? to talk about it yeah. and nobody would talk about it with her except me because my mom had just died and I was thinking about death all the time. And so we would have these secret conversations and she didn't even know anyone who had died. She was so young, she hadn't even lost a grandparent. And she kept saying, Claire, what if there's nobody there on the other side? And I just didn't have any answers for her, you know? And I was so curious and scared and sad and hopeful. And I had picked up a, a book by psychic medium John Edward on a whim, like that summer. And so I was telling her about it. And I was like, if you die, I will go see John Edward and find out where you are. And it was one of those promises I made literally like in her last week. And I didn't make good on it um, until I was in my early 30s in Chicago, a, mo a new mom working as a grief counselor. And I just was thinking about Julie a lot, thinking about how much I wish she had gotten to experience motherhood, and I think motherhood for me as well thrust me into another quest with this because um, I think a lot of new parents face this kind of death anxiety. What happens if I die? What happens, what will happen to my child? You know, you have this enormous responsibility suddenly to this little person and death becomes a whole new thing. What if I die, what's gonna happen? It sure does. Um, so yeah, I was like, I better make good on that vow to Julie. And so I went to see John Edward. <laughs> John Edward is a sort of controversial figure. He is. So what did you find when you went and saw him? I was really nervous. Um, I was nervous for a couple of reasons. I was nervous professionally. I was a, I was a grief therapist working in hospice. Mm -hmm. I, I, this was, I didn't know anybody who did this kind of yeah. thing in my field. You're stepping out. Um, I was definitely stepping out. Uh, I was nervous. I was really nervous that it would, it would be real. And then what was I going to do? What right. was I going to do with my whole belief system right. about everything but if it was real? Yeah. yeah, and I was curious. I was also curious, you right. know. Um, and it was, it was real enough. Like there were some really incredible moments that happened. Uh, details he brought forth that he just—I don't know how he could have known. I made my reservation under a false name. I paid in cash. I was really meticulous about it. I wanted to preserve the integrity of it because I knew I would question it myself if I didn't. But what I also saw that was remarkable to me and really interesting was in the group dynamic, there was 15 of us, 14 of us in the group that went to see John Edward that night. 
And I saw the same kind of healing and catharsis and communion that came in the grief groups I was leading in hospice. Mm -hmm. So whether or not he was really bringing forth deceased loved ones kind of stopped mattering to me because what I saw was a healing that went on from people joining together to talk about their lost loved ones, to recognize them, to acknowledge them. And there was something really incredible about that to me and so surprising. And it kind of kicked off this whole journey. Well, what was it for you that made you, rather than pass through and move on to some other phase of your life, say, this is an area where I can help other people and I want to stay here? I think a lot of it had to do with my father's death and hospice. Hospice was a revelation to me. My mother, when she was sick, she was fighting up until the very end, trying treatment after treatment, another surgery, another thing, and the doctors were trying, I mean, long past when she should have probably stopped and just had a peaceful death. And so her death wasn't peaceful, and that was really difficult for me and for the rest of us who loved her. My father, on the other hand, he was older, farther along in life, and he really wanted to just close out his life peacefully at home with me there. Um, I was 25 at the time. It was hard. All my friends were in their post-college jobs and doing their thing and boyfriends, and I was literally with my dad changing diapers and scrubbing his dentures. and. Um, I couldn't have done it without the hospice team that came. And just the way they embraced death is like, this is happening. You're saying goodbye to your father. He's going to die. Let's make this as beautiful and healing and easy as possible. Um, really changed my whole world. And, and I wanted to help other people do that. I wanted to make that conversation bigger. Um, so that's what I'm doing now. You are, so tell me, where, did, where are you now in terms of what's out there? And then how do you help other people when they ask you what happens next? Because nobody knows, obviously, yeah. but where are you when people ask you? Yeah, nobody knows. I did not find the answer. Yeah. <laughs> but um, That would be nice. You know, what I found for myself and something that I've taken into my work is the idea that I can still feel connected to the people that I miss and that I've lost. I didn't feel connected to them anymore. I just felt like they were wiped out of my life and that was really painful. And so I've developed all these tools and practices and you know, had actual experiences that have made me feel connected to them again. And that's been really powerful and it's been really like, it's eased a lot of my anxiety, a lot of my sadness. And so that's something I work with with my clients, you know, helping them explore their ideas about the afterlife. I don't have one particular belief necessarily. I don't want my clients to like, you know, you have to believe this or Buddhism's for you or whatever. Um, but I, I ask them now, you know, I just probe a lot more about their connections to the afterlife or their belief systems. I think people would love to actually have a real connection, with, you know, to the afterlife. And yet, I think the act of exploring provides the connection that you're talking about. Yeah. It allows you to keep people in your memory in a different way than if they were just, as you said, wiped out of your life. It does. Um, because you're, there's an act of engagement in them when they're a part of your life and where they might be now. And yeah. that process seems to be what keeps them in your life. Absolutely. But for some reason, it was so scary for me. You know, I really felt closed off to the idea of staying connected to them for a long time. And it's been really exciting and healing and fun and sweet to find my way back there. Yeah. I found it incredibly thoughtful and it made me really think about people that I haven't thought about in a while. And your yeah. book helped me do that and Thank I appreciate you. it. That makes me really happy. Yeah. Well thanks so much for being with <laughs> us. Thank today. you. Good thanks luck for having me. Yeah. Thank you.